Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and this is Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, we're going to deviate a bit from the usual focus on fiction to talk about writing for tabletop, role-playing games, and related media. RPGs have always been deeply interconnected with fantasy, sci-fi, and horror, and right now they are more popular and prevalent than ever before. James L. Sutter co-created the lore and story-rich fantasy RPG Pathfinder for Paizo Publishing, which has become one of the most popular role-playing games in the world. He then took the role of creative director on Starfinder, a science fantasy RPG that reimagined the world of Pathfinder in a spacefaring future. Along the way, he's written Pathfinder tie-in novels Death's Heretic and The Redemption Engine, plus a large body of short fiction and comics, RPG adventures and source books for Pathfinder, Starfinder, and Dungeons and & Dragons, and several video games. His latest book, Dark Hearts, is a departure from genre fiction, a young adult romance about estranged bandmates that must reconcile the loss of their best friend and their unexpected attraction to each other. Dark Hearts is available now from Wednesday Books, and all of the RPG work previously mentioned is available at your local game store or wherever books are sold. And James L. Sutter, welcome to Fictitious. Hey, thanks for having me. So, uh, no, nobody can see us because they're only going to be hearing this in audio, but um, I've got this big wall of books behind me, but over on the side is my big old shelf of RPG. Oh, nice. I have Pathfinder over there, and I also own approximately 837 Pathfinder books in PDF <laughs> format. <laughs> nice. So my like Apple books thing is just wall to wall and a lot of the fiction and stuff too. Uh, more than I'll probably ever be able to read. Um, but you know, that's, that's the beauty of being a book person. Yeah. That's how the hobby goes, right? Like, you know, everybody collects first and reads second. Right. Exactly. Like you, it's a need, like I must have all of it. You know, it's, it's an addiction. Maybe we all have a problem, but it's a good problem <laughs> to have, I think. So yeah. And feeding into the ecosystem is a big thing. Um, there's so much to kind of cover here. To say that like RPGs have had a moment over the last like five, 10 years uh, with everybody will point to Stranger Things kind of waking Dungeons and Dragons up into the world and, and uh, you know, things like Critical Role and, and Let's Play stuff and uh, the McElroy, you know, guys with Adventure Zone and all of those right. things like really bringing it to the forefront, bringing more people in and also just diversifying the world of yeah. RPG, um, not just in the kinds of genres, the type of games, the number of publishers, but also the type of people who play the game and are welcome into the game, which I think is a 100%. huge deal with it. So I think it, it's really relevant to this show in thinking about world building and thinking about creating fan bases for great storytelling um, and thinking about how many people who love sci-fi and fantasy are also role players. And how much that kind of goes in together to kind of talk about where you've come from, how yeah. you got into that, and then how you transitioned, you know, into directly into fiction writing as well. So to start off with, I think just like, let's talk a little bit more about your career in RPG. And I know you're much more than an RPG guy. No, but it's like, it's a huge part of my career. Yeah. So how did you get started with Paizo in the world of, of RPG and specifically like in the creation of Pathfinder? Because if people who are listening to this don't understand Pathfinder, that's a really interesting origin story for a game and where it came to fill a space in the market. So can you kind of talk me through that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a wild story, so I'll try to keep it brief. But, you know, I had always loved role-playing games ever since uh, my fifth grade teacher taught a bunch of us how to play first edition Dungeons and Dragons. And so, you know, I'd played it all up through childhood, uh, but I'd never really thought of it as a career prospect. And then, because, I mean, who does, right? Who, who looks at that and says, that's what I'm going to do for a living. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I went to college and thought I was going to be a journalist. And journalism in college was super fun because it was all sex, drugs, and rock and roll and going and having adventures and writing about them. And then I graduated and realized that your average newspaper doesn't actually want to pay you <laughs> to go <laughs> have adventures. So I was, you know, quickly becoming disillusioned and looking for something I could do. And I saw that uh, the company, Paizo, that published Dungeon & Dragon magazines, as well as Amazing Stories, was based out of Bellevue, which was right next to Seattle, where I lived. You know, I was 20 at the time, and I saw that they were hiring for an editor-in-chief for Amazing Stories. So I emailed the CEO of the company and said, hey, I am totally unqualified for that job, but, you know, <laughs> here's what I have done. Uh, do you have anything for me? And in one of the luckiest breaks of my life, the CEO, Lisa Stevens, actually emailed me back and said, yeah, come in for an interview. And so I go in there and I've got, you know, my little 
manila folder of all my newspaper clippings from you know the college paper and local like suburban newspapers and i guess she liked my hustle you know this little punk kid with his uh various column clippings so she gave me a job finding images for their new web store at a nicola jpeg like i was literally <laughs> a human web scraper but you know it was a foot in the door so i did that and then i became the editorial intern working on dungeon and dragon and getting some editing experience and then i became the customer service department and i mean the customer service department if you <laughs> if you called about your magazine subscription in the that year or two you got me and then after somewhere between one and two years i got to actually move up into being an assistant editor on Dungeon Magazine. And that was when I really started working in the industry. Of course, I had no experience doing it because nobody does. It's one of those jobs you only can learn by doing. But it was a great education. You know, I was learning how adventures worked, how to put all this stuff together, you know, getting to write creatively all the time and edit. And that lasted for a couple of years, and it was a blast. And then... Paizo lost the license to which so Dungeons and Dragons is owned by Wizards of the Coast and Paizo had licensed the right to do the magazines which have been around since the 70s and so they were producing them they were doing great and then Paizo lost the license it reverted to WotC and we said oh my god what are we going to do like we <laughs> we don't know how to do anything else um at that point the other two magazines about amazing stories and undefeated had both folded you know, we were losing the only magazines we knew how to make. And so we said, okay, well, we'll do a series of, well, uh, we'll do a thing that is not a magazine, but a monthly volume of uh, what we called the Pathfinder Adventure Path, which was adventures that would be strung together into a full sort of campaign. And, you know, that was, that was what we'd been doing in the magazines. It was really popular. And so we said, okay, well, we'll do this. We'll build our own world to go with it. And we did, and to our surprise, it was really popular. Uh, I think partially because a lot of people were sad about the magazines going out of print, um, and partially just because people had seen that we made really good adventure content, and people were used to getting that every month. So a ton of people stuck with us, and suddenly we had this new business model, but now we owned the setting, we owned the world, but we were still using the regular Dungeons & Dragons rules. And then about a year later, the new uh dungeons and dragons rule set came out and what people may not realize is that so dungeons and dragons is in a weird way kind of open source there was many years ago there was a version of the rules that was made essentially public so that anybody could use them and base their game their other games off of the dungeons and dragons rules as long as you followed a certain legal framework and so that's what that's what everybody had been doing and then this new version came out and was going to close a lot of that down. And so we kind of had two choices. Either we could try and go with official Dungeons & Dragons still, which created a lot of contractual problems and really put us in a lot of danger as a business, or we could do this wild thing where we took the open source rules, put our own spin on them, you know, kind of updated them with the changes we wanted to see, and put that out as our own game. And so that's what we did. We chose Optin 2 and made Pathfinder, which was a direct evolution of the at that time Dungeons and Dragons rules and again a lot of people came with us because a lot of people didn't want to shift to the somewhat dramatically different somewhat dramatically it was pretty <laughs> it was very it dramatic was, yeah it was dramatic to the different rules set and so suddenly we had our own game as well as our own world and that really took off and just led to a ton of expansion in terms of both the company and what we were able to put out, you know, more rule books, more world books, more adventures, and then all of the tie-in stuff that goes with owning your own IP. So like I got to run a novel line. We had comics that I got to work with. We, you know, had video games tied into it, you know, all the way down to, you know, plush goblins and things. And so, so <laughs> we found ourselves suddenly kind of at the middle of an empire and it was a huge drill, you know? And so I worked there, I was at Paizo for 13 years. And then in 2017, I stepped down as the creative director on Starfinder, which I guess I should also talk about. Over the time that I was there, I was an editor, I was a writer, I was a game designer and developer. 
Um, but I also got to be the person in charge of the novel line, the Pathfinder Tales novel line. So I was the executive editor there, meaning I got to go handpick all of the authors to write novels set in our world and then work with them from the beginning idea all the way through publication. And so that was a huge education and really taught me a lot about how to write a novel. You know, that was what inspired me ultimately to write my own. But then I also got to eventually when we created Starfinder, which was the sort of science fantasy evolution of Pathfinder, a lot of that setting was based on work I'd done during Pathfinder on the solar system of our fantasy setting. Um, because almost all of Pathfinder takes place on this one planet called Galarian. But we knew that there was a whole solar system going along with it. And being a big science fiction you know, nerd, I kind of asked all the other developers, hey, can I can I just create the other planets in the solar system? Like, is that cool? <laughs> and they were like, we're not messing with that. Go nuts with it. Um, and so I did in this source book called Distant Worlds, and it proved very popular. Like, fans were really into it. And so then when we made Starfinder, it was sort of a natural choice to use that solar system as the base setting for this new game. And then kind of because of that is one of the reasons why I got tapped to be the creative director in charge of leading the team that was creating the game, creating the world. It was a bonkers experience because just the way the timing worked out from the point at which we said, okay, we should do this new game. We should do Starfinder. We had one year almost exactly to go from we should do a game to that game is going to the printer. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, we had to create an entirely new rule set, a whole world to go with it, you know, all of this stuff. And we had a year to do it. And so it was the most fun and the most challenge that I ever faced during my time there. And so we launched it. It was really successful. And then shortly afterward, I said, you know what? I think I've done what I came here to do. So I uh, stepped down as creative director and left the company to just write full time. And so I, I still do stuff in the gaming world. I still write adventures and comics and stuff. But these days, I'm much more focused on novels. And especially like you mentioned, my new pivot into young adult romance, which I sure didn't see coming, but it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's definitely a, a uh, an off ramp for sure. Yeah. But it, it's still all in the the writing zone. So, it, you know, it's it's relevant here. In my own personal backstory, my friends from college, I mean, like after, basically after we all immediately got out of college, we were playing D&D 3.0 and, and 3.5, those editions of it. And then somewhere along the lines, we dropped out of it, as people sometimes do. Right, right. And we decided some years back to all hop back in, basically like 15, 16 years later, we're like, you know what? We kind of miss doing that. Let's do yeah. that again. But D&D 4th edition had come out and we found it impenetrable. And then we discovered Pathfinder. And so... We got into Pathfinder via the Rise of the Rune Lords uh, game. Yeah, path. yeah, the first one. Yeah, which is sort of the big granddaddy of all of those those uh, storylines um, and very immersive. And one of the things that I noted in going from D and D that D and D is very well known for its rich story worlds that whether it's Forgotten Realms or uh, you know Dragonlance, Planescape, all those different things yeah, that yeah. it has. But its core book is kind of uh, worldless. I technically. Yeah. It's was Greyhawk or something back in the day yeah. in second edition. But overall, it's sort of like uh, it's a it's a vehicle to tell your own stories, but it doesn't necessarily have its own world to start with. And that was interesting to me about going to Pathfinder is that it did have its own world. It had its very specific identity. And that's something I kind of want to talk about a, a little bit here as far as like figuring yeah. out like how you create fantasy identity in a world where there's a lot of already defined notions of what it is but yeah going into that i was like oh this is an extremely lore rich setting you know i mean you could just tell your own stories and do your own. the framework was there to yeah. to do your own homebrew but it started with here is the world here are the stories here are the type of people and cultures and you know and it was wildly different in a lot of ways you mentioned like the stuff goblins because the goblins became the sort of like you know identifiable element from it they really did they were one of the first things yeah i mean i i even sometimes when i see like grogu you know baby yoda i'm right, like right. baby yoda is a little pathfinder goblinish. um he's just you know cuter well you know and that really came from two places like that was one of the first things that came about and part of that was the goblin design by artist wayne reynolds he came up with a very unique design with the big sort of watermelon shaped heads and like the big ears. And then we all fell in love with that design. But then James Jacobs, who's the, I think the current creative director on uh, Pathfinder and was, you know, one of the architects 
way back in the day, you know, my boss back in the day, he just like loved that image and wrote out a list, I think just on our website of like 10 facts about goblins. And he just sort of spat out these kind of funny things like, you know, about goblins and how they love fire and they hate dogs. And specifically, one of the ones that I always loved was they hate reading because they think that uh, reading words steals the words out of your head and you can't get them back. <laughs> and just like he gave them this personality as these weird little murderous pranksters and folks just loved it. Like the Internet erupted and our fan base was so into it. And I think that that gave us a a sort of flavor from the beginning where it was like, this is going to be a setting that is taking things that you may already know and putting a new spin on it. And it's going to be funny and it's going to be weird and it's going to be dark and it's going to be all these different things. And I think that that early setting really just reflects the varied tastes of the handful of us that were on the project. Like there were not that many people creating the original setting for a Pathfinder back in the day. You know, now it's got damn near 20 years of, you know, lore and stuff going with it. But at the time, you know, there was only eight people working on the words related to the world it, at most. And then a couple of folks working on the art side. And that was it. Everybody was kind of throwing everything at the wall and just trying to make each other laugh or make each other say, oh, that's cool. You know, it's almost like we were writing as much for each other as for the audience. And I think that it really created this fun setting that had, you know, it has an overall feel, but also one of the things we were trying to do in the beginning was create a setting where you could play any type of fantasy that you wanted. You know, the the idea, the prevalent idea around settings at the time was like, you need to have something very specific in your flavor. You know, all the old second edition Dungeons and Dragons things, like you mentioned, Planescape or Birthright or whatever, those settings always had very specific flavors. When we did ours, we kind of tried to be everything to everybody, but the way we did that was to say, okay, there's a bunch of different nations and regions in our world, and every one of them will have its own distinct flavor. So if you like gothic horror, you can go to Ustalov, and that country will be full, your sort of like faux Transylvania. And if you want Conan and, or, you know, Vikings and dragons, like we've got a setting for that. You know, if you like guns in your fantasy, we'll have a nation that has guns, but only that one nation, you know, because so that people who don't like it can ignore it, you know? And I think by creating that sort of patchwork thing, we gave ourselves a lot of room both to let players find the type of game experience that they wanted, but also, frankly, to keep ourselves entertained. Like, there, it was so often where one of us would just kind of claim a little section or region of the world and say, hey, this is a thing I really love. Can I just, like, build this out? And then that would have our very specific flavor and tastes reflected where and then somebody else would have a totally different thing, you know, and that was always my favorite part of developing the world. I enjoyed working on, you know, the big group stuff and, you know, everybody kind of was in everybody else's business. It's not like we just divided and conquered, <laughs> but every so often I would be able to take a little portion like, you know, the solar system or the the fairy realm. I got to create, you know the world and the pantheon related to fairies, you know, and do kind of my own thing there. Or, you know, there was a city called Karamaga that's uh, a really weird sort of anarchic, a little bit our like Moss Eisley sort of setting. Um, and I got to early on to sort of build that city from the ground up. And like that sort of thing was really fun. But at the same time, like when you're working with such brilliant people, it's fun to play with their toys too. There's a thing that, um, that we talk about on the show fairly regularly, which is that when you're writing contemporary fantasy or science fiction. There's a certain question of how much of the conceits of the genre do you expect the audience to know coming in and that you can sort of hand wave away without having to do big info dumps or something. So for instance, in science fiction, it's like whether or not you need to define what a spaceship is, what is faster than light drives, you know, how, what is a laser gun in fantasy? It's, are you doing that sort of Tolkien-esque European fantasy or are you deviating from it in, you know, interesting ways and whatever? And so, you know, that question is always like, how much do you just go, okay, the, the, the audience probably already knows this, so I'm not going to spend the time boring them with stuff they already know. And that can be complicated in some books because I think sometimes authors will do it kind of the, the wrong way and, and, and it ends up genericizing things because they... They just say, oh, well, here's a spaceship, and they don't even bother to tell you what it is, what the flavor, right. the, the flavor is not there, and that can be a problem. 
in a role playing game like this, I feel like you you're in the opposite situation where you have to be prescriptive about pretty much everything because the audience coming in, they may be wanting to build their own worlds and they may want that open space. But a lot of them are looking for a guide rail to say, here's like you said, here's the flavor. Here's the, yeah. you know, the sense of what's going on. Like you talked about with Pathfinder, you created all these different continents or nations where you could play with those flavors. Going into that, how much more of that was that a conversation in the room with the other writers that you're like, okay, we need to nail down what this is here, like, and how much of it is that, like, you know, the audience is going to come in knowing what they want and how much of it is like telling them what it is in this particular context? I mean, I think to a certain extent you can lean into tropes because that's part of the fun of it, right? Like, you know, we wanted to make sure that all the tropes were reflected. And I think what you, what you do is just lean into the parts that are different, that make them interesting. You know, you have your trope and then you say, what is, what is the twist we're going to put on it? We're always going to put a little bit of our own flavor in there. Like for instance, you know, elves are a trope and like the Pathfinder elves are very similar to Tolkien elves and Dungeon Dragon elves, all those types of elves you've seen before, but they're also aliens from another planet. And so they have, you know, a few interesting things or like one of the things we leaned into that I really liked was this idea of, what we called the forlorn, which is when you think about elves, they live for a really long time. What does that do to your psychology if you're out among humans or other races that live a much shorter time? And so the idea of forlorn elves were elves that live among shorter lived societies. And so they've seen just wave after wave of friends and families and lovers like come and go. And like, what does that do to your psyche? And I feel like just those couple little details give you a different flavor. And so you can have your elf, but now you've got something new and interesting to play with. And I feel like trying to do that with kind of everything, like what is the hook? Um, And the hook can be a detail like that. The hook can be an actual adventure hook. You know, like when I'm designing a setting, I always say that the, the point of a RPG setting book is not to give everybody all the information. It's to inspire the game master to create their own thing. So you want to ask questions. You want to raise ideas within them even more than answer the questions and lay out all the, all the plots and things. And so when I'm writing a, a gazetteer of a town or a nation or whatever, I think it's important to every paragraph or two drop a detail that somebody could use to start a whole game session, a whole adventure. So if you're writing about an inn, you know, don't just write the same old fantasy in, you know, have some detail like, for instance, maybe the bartender, you know, is in hiding and they are the lost son of the empress. And at any point, the royal guards could come in to drag them back, you know, and then, okay, great. That's an adventure that your players can play. Or maybe there's a painting over the mantelpiece that on the night of the full moon, it whispers a a numerical code and nobody knows what it means, right? You don't have to know what it means either, but if it (laughs) makes the game master go, Oh, what could that be? I, you know what that could be? That could be to the lock and blah, blah, blah. Getting the game master thinking is the whole point. And so I'm always trying to do that. I'm always trying to lay those trails and, that's very much the approach we took to Pathfinder. That's the approach I've taken to all my Dungeons and Dragons work too. Like I actually got to do explicitly that a few years ago when they revived Baldur's Gate as a setting for Dungeons and Dragons. One of my friends who's a developer over there contacted me and said, hey, we have all this setting material for Baldur's Gate, but we want to spice it up. And so they brought me in to work on the city and basically just go through every location and make sure that in addition to the information about the place, there was also adventure there. There was fun. There was something that uh, you could use that could inspire you to actually play a game there. That's the approach that I always take when doing setting design. Good fiction is often, to me, one of the defining traits is that once you get done with it, whether it's in a movie or a book or a podcast or whatever, that you want to run around it in your head for a while. Yeah. You know, like that, like, I, I think that's, you know, one of the things when like, you know, Star Wars first appeared on the scene in the seventies that people afterwards couldn't stop thinking about being in that space. Lord of the Rings definitely does that. Tons and tons of great fiction has that thing where like you want to be in the world. Um, And I think uh, for tabletop, you know, RPG writing, that's like the pinnacle of it, right? Is that you're trying to, to create things that make people go, Oh, 
I want like for a DM who might have to spend like I do, because I have a Tuesday night game that I've run for the last three years. I have 140,000 words of world building right, written for my right. setting, right? That you wrote for yourself. Right. Like you didn't pay for that. Uh, that's the thing that's always bonkers to me. And the thing that I love about it is I'll be at a convention and somebody will tell me how they've been playing in some lost city for three years and they'll be so excited about it. And they'll be thanking me for like creating this setting. And I'm thinking I wrote one paragraph about that at like <laughs> 2 a.m. in a book you know, five years ago. I don't even remember it. But you've taken that seed and created this giant thing you know world based around it you're getting in rpgs you can get the reader and the player to do all the work or you know to do a big chunk of the work for you and like when you've done that that's when you're really winning right because i mean it is by its nature it's collaborative storytelling yes. um you know the the dungeon master or the game master has to do a lot of heavy lifting as far as you know getting the world up and running but once you sit down with the players they are creating that story along with you and so yeah making a thing that stays immersive and maybe gets off the rail and lets them figure out where they want to go if they can decide to my, my players are very <laughs> decisive so sometimes they don't right. know where to go but but yeah all of that is a big part of it i think that like i think there's a lot of people who want to be authors who get really really into world building um because that can be one of the most fun parts of the process sure. right because you you have this setting these characters this sense of conflict or environment but some people get lost in it. I mean, I know other like aspiring writers who have spent 10 years world building and then realizing that they're not good at stringing together a plot. And then yeah. I'm always like, maybe you should just be focusing in RPG. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, trying to write for those kinds of things, creating those sort of things, or just, you know, running games, or just, you know, you could also writing for enjoyment is, is very much a thing. Sure. Well, if it doesn't cause you crippling, you know, anxiety to do so. <laughs> so I'm curious for your take on the idea of the relevance of RPG games and writing for them and, and also just how they affect the world of fiction. Because now, like you said, you've, you know, you're developing out your own stuff. I mean, Dark Hearts is not necessarily something you would do in a role-playing game around. Um, yeah. Although, I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> right. Uh, but um, it seems to me that in this moment in time, with you know such a huge popularity surge for RPGs, a bigger proliferation of the kinds of games there are and the different systems and, and everything from super, super number-crunchy things for some people who are into that kind of thing that are you know on the tactical wargaming side of thing, to right. very, very streamlined systems that, you know, mostly keep the dice out of the way and just let theater of the mind play and, you know, and people to do their thing. For you as a writer who's come out of that world but is writing fiction, what do you think it, it creates as opportunities for authors, whether they are just entering the fray or if, let's say, they already have a trilogy that people like, and maybe there's opportunities there to develop something into their own RPG world? So in terms of the opportunities to create an RPG based on a fiction property. I think it's possible, but I think it's way harder than people realize. There's the old joke that, you know, what's the best way to make a small fortune in the RPG business? It's start with a large fortune. And that's, <laughs> that's largely true. There are only, people see, um, you know, all these RPG books filling the game store, but I can count on one or maybe two hands the number of RPG companies that actually make enough money to have a staff that's not just two people with a pallet of books in their garage. And not that there's anything wrong with that. Like, that's awesome if that's your passion. But I think oftentimes people see the, the prevalence of these games and think, oh, there's a big opportunity here. And the truth is, it just it costs a lot of money to make a, a good RPG. Because in addition to all the time you have to spend on the rules and the writing and all those things, artwork is so important and print quality and all of these things and it just people also aren't really willing to pay what it actually costs to produce right uh one of these games right because you know people will look at a book like you know pathfinder or starfinder you know the core rule books that are these big meaty textbooks and say you know well this is fifty dollars i'm not going to pay fifty dollars <laughs> for a book and you you're saying this book is you know 600 pages of full color, beautiful art from amazing illustrators. It had a team of 30 people working for a year to make it. These things cost a lot of money. And yeah, you can do it with less, but people have come to expect these, you know, high quality production values. And so I think that's the reason why you only see a couple of companies, places like Dungeons and Dragons, which are able to 
you know, they're owned by Hasbro. They're able to put real money behind it because they're the juggernaut. They're the name everybody knows. But even someplace like Paizo, which is, you know, Pathfinder, if you say that's the, you know, the, you know, the second place after Dungeons and Dragons culturally, which I make no claims, but I think that has certainly been true at times. Maybe it mm-hmm. still is. But I think that when people look at that, they don't realize how thin the margins actually are, like how little money there is. I mean, things are getting better in the RPG industry, like Paizo just unionized recently. But, you know, for a long time, it's like you're making you have this dream job and you're making minimum wage. Like there's not that much money. I was definitely, you know, remember the t- the days of making twenty four thousand dollars a year, thirty thousand dollars a year, you know. And so it's, did I love my job? Like absolutely. Was I also living with ten roommates and eating out of dumpsters? Also, yes. <laughs> like both of those things are true. Um, that's getting a little bit of field, but I feel like that's important to know because I've had a number of author friends, you know, with successful fantasy and science fiction properties ask me, hey, should I do this thing? And the answer is almost always no. Like unless, you know, or, you know, if you want to license it to a company, there are companies like, uh, you know, Green Ronin or whoever who do license books and make good licensed IP RPGs. That's a great situation. If you want to get into that situation and they're interested, awesome. Like there's sort of no downside. But if you're going to try to do it yourself, uh be ready to lose a lot of money and a lot of time uh, because it's just a very hard market to crack. Like the, one of the beautiful things about role-playing games is that everybody who plays one is a creator. Mm -hmm. If you are playing, if you are running the game, you are telling stories, you are building the world and it creates this great sense of, I could do this too. And the answer is you can, but everybody else also has that sense so you're competing with everybody else who also wants to make a role-playing game and so the market is just constantly glutted and also as much as people love sometimes buying new role-playing games i find that most of the time people don't actually want to learn how to play a new role-playing game and so you'll have somebody who you know maybe maybe they even buy a bunch of books but they're just going to keep playing DD or pathfinder because everybody's tired and has jobs and kids and whatever it's hard to convince a group to learn a whole new system so there's there's a lot of challenges it can be done but uh be careful there was a a couple of years ago i did a panel with the author brian mcclellan and (laughs) i was uh, i was thinking of brian because i had this conversation with brian when he was starting to do uh, a power mage rpg right because uh i i can't remember if they had kickstarted or crowdfunded it in some way in order to get it going but um when he was uh we were on a panel at emerald city in seattle and he talked about how the hardest project of his writing career was writing for the rpg of powder mage (laughs) yeah because he writes these chonky 500 page like fantasy epics but he was like the thing that was the hardest for him to do was to sit down and figure out how to make the world building and how to work with because he wasn't doing the game design but he was doing the world building outside of that because he was like i think in linear story and here i had to think in this encompassing you know sandbox and he was like that's a completely different type of of brain to make that work yeah no as it turns out like i talk to brian darn near every day um and so i like (laughs) i you know was was there witnessing that (laughs) that process um and i think that ultimately like you know i i think if you asked him he would say like it's really cool like what they Mm -hmm. came up with is great and he's proud of it and oh my god that was an ungodly amount of work and i never want to do it again there's been other authors that I've talked to that have had things kind of in the works, like uh, Fonda Lee's um, uh, Green right. Bone Saga. Um, yeah. I'm not sure where that's at in development because that was supposed to be being developed um, into an RPG at one point. But it's been a couple of years since I've talked to her, so I'm not sure exactly where that's at. That's a very unique setting and you know very oh, martial yeah. arts oriented, so it, you know it, it kind of equates to some different things. And I think if you have a good hard magic system, I think that often really translates well to an rpg it would not surprise me at all if something like the Greenbone saga did well or you know anything sanderson based like oftentimes like those books are aimed at people who like the gamification who like to think about here's what i would do in this setting with these powers it's very delineated it's very easily understood with principles that you can understand and then come up with new uses for and so like that lends itself really well to a game whereas i think that If you're not doing that sort of thing, if you have sort of a a loose soft magic system or if you don't have 
something that is easily gamified, it's very hard to make your RPG feel different than just just another setting. You know, like if all you have is a different world, but it's basically the same play style as Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, I think that that can be a real problem for folks. Like, you no, know, maybe it's just a skin that people layer over their game because they want to play in your world. But I don't know. I think it I think it helps a lot if there's something really unique in the gameplay itself. I think a lot of uh, really popular YA novels that would maybe have a fan base that would be interested in going sure. and playing in those worlds would struggle, particularly for what you're talking about as far as the mechanic side of things, because there is a lot of more hand wavy, soft magic, no you know consistent rules, a lot of the a lot of plot armor and a lot of uh, the magic does what it needs to do in a particular moment. Well, and you can do great fiction with soft magic, right? Like yeah. I, I think oftentimes like when I, when I teach classes on building magic systems, you know, we talk about hard magic appeals to a specific type of reader and soft magic appeals to a specific type of reader. And if they're often good for different things, for instance, horror almost always works better with soft magic. Yes. Right. Because if you understand it too much, that removes some of the mystery and terror. If you know exactly how many spells the bad guy has, that's not <laughs> nearly as horrifying as just, I don't know, the dark, the dark cult leader has some sort of ability, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think it's just important to know what audience you're shooting for. And like, do you want that Brandon Sanderson, Mistborn style, like really regimented magic? Or do you want, something that's soft or do you want something that's in between right like a lot of things fall in between where it's there's a system and a structure but not all of the angles have been explored yeah i think um it can be a dirty word to reference at these days but like like you look at like harry potter i was or, exactly thinking of that yeah i mean it's it lands in that middle where like there are things that that are clearly understood as far as like how it works and then there's plenty of places where it absolutely veers off from its own rules and doesn't contain its internal consistency it makes sense how you could make video games and stuff out of it but a lot of people right. have talked over the years they're like why you know why haven't they done a you know an rpg of this because obviously like there's a fan base that would love to go running around in these yeah. worlds and i think that the two problems is that one that the, the magic system then has to be codified in a way that will be really difficult with it and two it's that actually running stories inside of a school can be hard yeah well, and I think, to be clear, systems like Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder or Starfinder, those are not hard magic systems in my mind. Those are halfway in between because they have that top-level structure of the magic system is if you know the spell, you can cast it. But there's not really a, a basic principle behind, well, how come I can cast Fireball, but I can't, and like, you know, create a Fireball, but I can't create a line of fire? How come I can't, you know... Like, all I can do is exactly what the specific spell does. We often refer to that as Vancean magic, based on sort of like the Jack Vance novels back in the day. You know, I think Dungeons & Dragons magic, as it was sort of originally conceived, I think came primarily out of Jack Vance for that style of, the spell does exactly what it does, and you just know a collection of spells. And also uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's sort of Earthsea stuff with the different schools of magic. I think blending those two together is kind of how you got what we think of as role-playing game magic. And I think that that's, you know, that's halfway in between. That's not, it's not the pure science of Sandersonian hard magic, but it's also not the super soft, numinous Lovecraftian magic or whatever. And it leaves some or an interpretation space for the game master to decide how something works in it. Sure. Even though it's prescriptive, but it is not like, say, like a Warhammer fantasy, like you do this and it does this and, you know, hits things. So. Right. Yeah, no, that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. And I think that, I think also there's the, the question that happens a lot. And I, I swear that I remember you tweeting about this a couple of years ago, <laughs> okay. because I'm pretty sure I've bookmarked it somewhere, or even saved it out as like a PDF or something. But it was, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, if this wasn't you, but it was talking about when you're building out a magic system is that it's always a question of cost. Like what right. is the offset for it? Because in a lot of these magic systems are really hand waving people just do some magic but that if you really want to make it work you have to have an understanding of like does it cost you as a person does it cost a material or is there a risk involved with using it because magic in the harry potter way is a little too easy to just be like i just throw out cantrips like all day long um no big deal but there should be a resource cost for it and that should be potentially devastating depending on what it is 
Yeah, yeah. And I'm certainly not the first person to say that uh, magic should have a cost. But I think that the point of that is that the cost helps create struggle, which is where story comes from, right? Like you need to have that struggle in order to make things fun and interesting, right? And so I think it is useful to keep your magic, like make sure there is a cost that actually matters to the character. It's useful to keep the magic simple and like by keeping it simple, allow it to be used in a lot of different ways um, and like limited uh, in its scope. Like you don't want to give somebody a Swiss army knife. You want to give them like one tool that they can then use in a whole bunch of different ways because that's much more interesting. You know, like if you have your character is, you know, they have uh, magic, they're a dishwasher at the local tavern. And so all their magic is around culinary stuff. It's actually a much more interesting story if they have to fight the dragon with dishwashing magic, than if they <laughs> off also have to have happen to have a spell of, you know, dragon be gone. And so I think um, like limiting magic creates more interest. Very legends and lattes esque. Yeah, of, I know. Uh, right. Kind of thing there. Yeah. There's something I want to touch back on there. And I, in this show is, is usually much more about the, you know, the actual mechanics of, of writing stories. Sure. Well, we can get into that. Oh yeah. But the thing I want to kind of come back to is that you were sort of talking about, you know, the financial realities of writing oh, yeah. role playing and stuff. And I think it, it very much mirrors most creative pursuits right now, right? Like mm -hmm. authors, I mean, you talk about the game market being glutted. I mean, there are more authors in both traditional publishing and indie publishing and hybrid right now than kind of ever before. And actually getting books in front of people, finding audiences, building fan bases is tougher. You know, you have a lot of things that are crowdfunding where it can come to fruition, but it may never get an audience beyond that initial crowdfunding group, all those things. So it can be a really challenging time to be a pro writer. You talked about how you're living with like 10 roommates um, <laughs> Yeah. for a lot of writers, you know, the prevailing wisdom is uh, have a spouse with a good job yeah. um, because no, that's the only I, way you true. can survive for you now, because you write gaming books, you've written for video games, you, uh, you, you write comics, um, you have novels that's kind of crossing over in a lot of different arenas. It makes me think of people like a uh, Gareth Hanrahan or a Matt Forbick, these people who are writing, yeah. you know, across a lot of different things in order to, you know, make the ends meet, you know, you're writing, yeah. you know, RPG, you're writing novels and stuff like that. Funny because Gareth actually wrote for me a bunch for Pathfinder before uh, doing novels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gareth has been on the show before with his, uh, his book, The Gutter Prayer. Yeah. And, uh, and I have some of his stuff in the gumshoe system and I find him a really compelling world builder because I mean the Black Iron Legacy books I'm like it's, it's such amazing interesting and I, again it's one of those you read it and you're like I want to play this <laughs> you know right, I want right. to read it but I also want to play in this world but for a writer working in this moment where it is so challenging what advantages do you have as far as being able to write cross genre you know or cross medium in this way but also what challenges does it create Oh, I mean, I think diversification, right, is like any sort of investment, right? Like, and diversification is really useful um, because you never know. I mean, there were several times early in my career at Paizo where it seemed like the company was just going to go under, right? Like, I distinctly remember when the magazines went away. You know, I think I was 23 or something at the time. And so, like, sitting in that meeting and thinking, I could go to grad school. Like, that would be fine. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm, this will be great. So I think that you never want to be so all in on one company or one genre that if it collapses, you've got nothing. That said, that also is a little bit self-serving because I'm kind of a dilettante. Like I love writing a lot of different things. I feel like it keeps me really fresh. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's useful to have a lot of legs under that income table. The downside, of course, is that if you're spreading yourself all over the place, it can make it a lot harder to really get a big name in one particular field. I think sometimes that like I'd be potentially a lot farther in my novel career if I just focused on novels, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if I was just doing comics all the time instead of occasionally, you know, that sort of thing. Like there is value to focusing in, especially if there's a particular art form or, you know, style that you really like, there's value to focusing in. But I would be careful of about focusing too much on one particular company, especially, or one particular game system. Um, because I've definitely seen people get hurt by that, where, you know, they've written a ton for X game, and then that game goes away, and suddenly they have, you know, no connections outside of that. I also think, frankly, that 
that diversification is really useful mentally and emotionally. When I was at Paizo, you know, I was working there full time. And then like most of us, we would go home and we would freelance, right? So most of Paizo's content is written by freelancers, but those freelancers might very well be staffers just working as contractors off the clock. You know, it would be one of these things where I would work on the game all day and then I would come home and I would work on the game all night. <laughs> and like, yeah, you're getting two different paychecks, but I've seen how that could lead some of my coworkers to really being upset when they've poured so much of their life into that game that if something doesn't go their way creatively, if something, you know, happens in a book gets canceled or if something you're just there's so many different conflicts that can arise when you're working in a team setting on an IP that you don't own. Right. That pouring all of yourself into it can be really emotionally fraught. And so for me, it was always really useful to be like, OK, yes, I'm working on this a bunch, but also I'm writing a novel in my spare time or I'm gigging with a band, you know, having these other things that were separate and just mine allowed me to be much more chill about the collaborative process at work, especially because whenever you're working for IP, like in games, unless you own the company, you probably don't own anything you've produced. So like I did a ton of work on Pathfinder and Starfinder, and I wrote novels set there and I've written comics and all those things. And I own 0% of it. I don't even get like royalties on any game books or anything like nobody at the company does. So when I walked away after 13 years, you know, I got the skills and the connections and the experience that I'd built in that time. And, you know, what fan base had bothered to learn my name instead of just Pathfinder, you know, and that those are all wonderful things. I learned a ton, but I don't own any of it. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to be careful about how you're investing things. And I think it's always worth it to have something creator owned that you're working on at the same time just as a lottery ticket you know i mean i think you know for for instance dark hearts dark hearts was a crazy idea you know i've spent my entire career working in adult science fiction and fantasy in various capacities and here i'm going to write a contemporary young adult queer romance novel set in seattle that was fun but it didn't make any sense <laughs> uh except that like it happened to work out and now it's, you know, it sold for better than I was used to, uh, you know, writing fiction by quite a lot to put real numbers on it. I have made 10 times more money off of that novel than, you know, either of my Pathfinder novels. And it's it's only been out two months or one month at this point. Yeah. So you never know what's going to hit. And I think that's part of the value of really diversifying what you're working on. But also, it's just fun. Like, it's really easy to get burnt out if you're just doing, you know, epic fantasy all the time. As a person with ADHD, I don't even fundamentally understand how to do only one thing. Um, <laughs> right. But I admire it. You know, when I see people who are, you know, when I, I look at I'm, uh, Lee Bardugo has been on the show a couple of times. Right. And, you know, and so, you know, she's nurtured her world and she writes more than just the Grisha verse. But she has turned yeah. that into an extraordinarily successful book world and now a Netflix show and mm -hmm. is hit that type of writer thing where like very few authors are able to do that thing to hit that, yeah. you know, level. And very few people are Neil Gaiman or, you know, yeah. you know, in that, that echelon of somebody who gets to actually just go out and play and then gets to see their work get adapted and changed and put out that many times. Yeah. Um, but that's the dream, right? That's what we're like. Yeah. Everybody's looking to do is to create something that sticks that much. And having the opportunity to both tell those kinds of stories that matter to you and that are going to be like, you know, personal and that you own, which is very, very important from yeah. a career standpoint, but being able to supplement it with the work for hire, essentially kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah, I used to be peripherally attached to the comics world. And, you know, that was the great gripe of many comic creators where they were like, oh, I've done all this work for Marvel and DC or, you know, yeah. these different places. And I, I might have created an iconic character that everybody loves, but I don't own it. Yeah. Well, and nobody even necessarily knows that you created it unless they're a deep comics nerd. Right. And know? maybe at the end of the movie, when they show up, you get a, you know, a thanks in the byline. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. Some people manage to have gotten a payday out of that, depending on how their contracts were negotiated. But yeah, overall, you get a lot of people who are creating things that may go on to be very important. But oftentimes, you know, it, it, there was the, thing for a long time where the guy who created rocket raccoon 
was like basically hospitalized and living off of yeah. social security even though he had a character that was in you know one of the biggest film right. franchises of the last 10 years and right. and that's brutal it's a really difficult thing to look at it and that's you know we as we were speaking sag aftra and wga yeah. are all on strike and good you know what yeah. i mean like we need to defend the creative arts we need to defend the people who are making them and we need to stop having people at the top who are essentially empty suits um, who are just running a, a you know a media machine funneling money into their own pockets and and away from the people who actually create the things that we love right it's funny how much of a cliche i mean and by funny i mean depressing how much of a cliche <laughs> it is among comics and rpg people of the idea of the gofundme right like mm -hmm. where you get sick and you have to run a gofundme no matter what you created because that's your only way to directly access the money of all the fans who have been paying for the thing that you created and so one thing that it's important to know when you're going to work in any sort of media tie in, whether that's games, whether that's writing novelizations of movies, even like, you know, a Star Wars novel or something. One of the writers I used to hire a bunch on uh, the Pathfinder novels, Dave Gross, always said this thing, which is when you're working in media tie in, the floor is higher, but the ceiling is lower. You know, you're going to get paid. You know, the book's going to come out. And those are really beautiful things, especially if you're somebody who needs the motivation of a contract and needs the motivation of knowing that, like, this project will succeed and will get out there like that. That can be wonderful, but you're not going to hold the same lottery ticket of, you know, if you write a Star Wars novel and it sells, you know, 500,000 copies, like you're probably not seeing a whole lot of that money. You know, if you write a game, a game book and it becomes a smash hit you're not going to get to participate in the film version of that. It's just important to know about yourself, like where you fall. And some people love it. Like if you're somebody who writes fast and loves working in an existing world, then I think tie-in can be a really fun thing. But if you're somebody who wants a lot of creative control and likes to take their time on a project and wants to really build and change the world, you're probably going to be better suited doing your own thing. There's obviously there's like legacy authors like an Alan Dean Foster who like, sure. you know, part of his bread and butter was playing in media tie ins. I think of somebody like Madeline Rue, who has her own very solid sci fi and fantasy novels, but also is doing things in Dungeons and Dragons and um, World of Warcraft and stuff like that. Right. But then you, you get instances like take like a Chuck Wendig, who um, sure. wrote a very successful uh, Star Wars novel, but then also because a chunk of that fan base is heavily toxic, he got to write in this, like you said, like, you know, one of the, the high echelon kind of things that makes people excited and you yeah. get a good paycheck for, but then also got a lot of hate and got a lot of, uh, yeah. of backlash and then, you know, got fired essentially from working on their IP because of weird political reasons that didn't yeah, make any sense because of Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Because of Twitter, essentially. Yeah. It's such a, it's a weird landscape to be dealing with those kinds of things where you can be like, oh, I got paid and I got to do a dream job, but it also kind of sucks. And it also might not be a dream job. Like, I'm not going to name names, but like I have a number of friends who have written Star Wars novels uh, in recent years. It, the conditions are rough. Like the payday is not what you would expect for something tied into a franchise like that. And oftentimes people are, you know, given months or weeks to, <laughs> to write these things. And so, you know, you're just being set up for failure and burnout like in all these different ways like that was when i was running the pathfinder novel line it was really important to me as i you know started to get to know a lot of tie-in authors or people who'd done this work it was important to me to do tie-in correctly tie-in the way i would want it to be done which meant like as close to the creator-owned process as possible so i would give people you know from the time at which i signed a novel idea I would give people a year to write it. I would give people the amount of time that they needed. And I would, you know, when I hired somebody, I would go out and find authors, usually folks who were already doing their own independent stuff, but who I knew liked Pathfinder because they told me like, oh my God, I love the game. You know, I'm a fan. And mm -hmm. um, then I would say, okay, great. Well then here's, you know, our setting Bible. Go through it. Tell me what sparks you. Tell me what sort of ideas you would love to play with. And then I'll help you work to like, make that into a story that fits within our overall game strategy and just sort of like really work collaboratively and try to give people as much creative ownership as possible. Now, legally, they still didn't own it. I mean, I don't own my novels, but I just tried to make that experience as close as possible to just writing a novel. 
And I think we got really high quality work as a result. I hope that the knock on benefit of writing those kinds of things is an entry point for people to find you that maybe wouldn't have otherwise. That if they're like, oh, I'm a fan of X property, let's say that like they're like, oh, I love Stranger Things and I just picked up this novel and oh, this was really great. This this author, Gwen DeBond, really, you know, I right. really like her writing style or whatever. And then you, you know, move on to find her books elsewhere. That kind of thing. I hope that's the thing that happens. I, I, the weird thing is I don't know how much it happens. I know mm -hmm. it happens some. Like yeah. I absolutely have folks who say, oh, I loved your Pathfinder stuff. I'll check out this new thing you've done in a totally different genre. And I think the closer the genre is, the better. Like probably I would have had a much easier time drawing Pathfinder and Starfinder fans into a big, you know, fantasy novel yeah. than into queer young adult romance like that's right. a very specific <laughs> and like extreme flavor shift but at the same time i think that you know common wisdom is that not a lot of people follow you over like a mm -hmm. lot of people are there for the brand name and maybe they notice who the author is but it's not nothing right so i think it can be useful and i certainly think if you're just starting out i think that having my first novel be a pathfinder novel was really helpful you know i did get it in front of a lot of people that probably wouldn't have picked it up if i had just put out a novel as James Sutter. But yeah, I think it's not as much as you want. Like, which is why, you know, a lot of people will write the tie-in novel for Star Wars or whatever, get that New York Times bestseller credit, and that that they can then put on their books for the rest of their life, but it doesn't transfer over. Like you're not gonna get that same sort of impact. Um and actually I was really surprised with Dark Hearts in some ways how little my career up to that point mattered to the folks who were buying it, which was both gratifying and frustrating right because on the one <laughs> hand it was gratifying that was like oh it really just was just about the book like people mm -hmm. just thought this book is good it will do well let's buy it but at the same time you know it's like oh i've i've actually done a lot of stuff like i've, been, I've spent a lot of time building up this you know relationship with fans and everything and so i was very surprised when at the number of people on my publisher side who were like oh what is tell me about this gaming thing. Like, what's, mm -hmm. what's that all about? I'm like, oh, huh, okay. Like, it's very easy to feel like that's the whole world and to forget that, as with most sorts of fame, like, most people who are famous are big frogs in very specific small ponds. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I think it's also, it's a weird thing whenever professionally something that you do gets known is that you can have years and years of experience doing something else and that it just doesn't carry over in a way that people are aware of. And so, right. and I want to use this to kind of transition into Dark Hearts here too, to talk sure. briefly about that. Because, you know, you would, our musician, I'm a musician. Um, yeah. I was a high school band guy, I played in college, um, you nice. know, all of those kinds of things. So there's stuff in Dark Hearts that's very familiar to me uh, from, you know, personal experience. But those are not necessarily things people knew about you, right? Like that's, that's, a, that's a chunk of your life that didn't necessarily relate to those things. And I think it's kind of interesting to go into this part of your career now that seems kind of separate from everything else. Was there ever any push to like write under like a pseudonym or anything to separate that brand from the previous work? No, thankfully. Um, and I think partially because, you know, we did want to capitalize on my existing, you know, works. I do have people who follow my writing and like that. I wanted to get as much of that as possible. And I also think that they're among the folks who were really engaged fans, because there are no fans in the world as engaged as RPG fans. Right. Like the, the folks who were really hardcore were on the message boards every day talking with us for the 13 years that I was there. So like I got to know a lot of them and your personality does tend to leak out. Right. And so actually, I think a lot of people weirdly did know that I was a musician and did know, you know, because I had done enough interviews or talked about it. But yeah, no, I, and I think we wanted to. I wanted to tie so specifically into my life because the book is in a lot of ways based on my life. Like I was never, you know, almost famous like that, but it was drawing on the fact that I had played in bands, you know, all through high school. And specifically the book was based on that feeling of being 18, 19 and watching bands younger than you start to get signed or blow up and feeling like you've missed your shot. You know, like that's the whole the whole premise of Dark Hearts is that this kid was in a band in high school, quit right before the rest of the guys got famous. And now he's sort of stuck in his regular high school life while they're off being world class pop stars and just sort of the resentment and feeling of failure with that 
which then of course turns into a rom-com as he and the lead singer reconnect. But, you know, I feel like there are a lot of kids that are walking around, whether from music or theater or sports, but with that feeling of, I was supposed to make it by now. You know, I was supposed to be the childhood phenomenon, the success right out of high school. I was supposed to go pro. And then they don't. And what do you do with that feeling? And that's definitely a feeling that I had. You know, I, as it turns out, I did get to play at the local level all through my 20s and whatnot. And it was really fun. But I never became a rock star. And so, like, what do you do with that is sort of at the center of the book. And along with, you know, that question of identity, plus, of course, the book is a queer love story with a character who does not realize he's queer at the beginning of the book. And so that was also part of my story of just that realization of like, oh, I'm really not who I thought I was. <laughs> like, what do you do with that when all of these labels that you use to define yourself to yourself suddenly no longer apply? Like that feeling of being kind of adrift. And so given that so much of that was from my own life, I'm glad I got to write it under my own name. And I'm glad that you didn't get pushed on that. I, th 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 oh, it seems yeah. like right now that there is this idea in publishing that authors that are, that are writing in cross genre um, should not write under the same name because it's confusing to their audiences and because there are certain... I don't know. It seems like there's been backlash at times for people who are like, oh, I write urban fantasy primarily and then I wrote a sci fi novel or I wrote something completely out of genre. And then they were like, oh, but uh, the, the, the fan base got mad. And I don't I don't understand it because I'm not that kind of reader. The weird thing is, I think there are a couple good reasons to do it. But I think that overall, the audience itself is savvy enough. Like, yeah. I think most people can understand like, oh, you write multiple things. OK, I think where it becomes a problem is it's the bookstore buyers, the people who are deciding like what goes on the shelves at Barnes & Noble. If you can have trouble there where something, uh, especially if you're trying to do something very different or if your previous series didn't perform the same way, like it can be confusing if you have four you know, science fiction books and one romance book, like people are used to shelving you all together. Yeah. And so a book buyer, and I'm not talking about the bookstore workers, you know, the people who are actually putting the books on the shelves, they got it. They're not yeah. confused. But it's the person who's at the, you know, departmental level, like the regional level, going through really quickly through the spreadsheet and going, which authors, how many copies are we going to buy of each? Like, I think it does help to keep things sort of segregated. It's also useful, like, it's hard these days as an author to survive just writing one book a year for a lot of people. And so a lot of authors are writing multiple books. And I think there's a fear of sometimes competing with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so having several different pen names means you can put out several books a year, but nobody's getting burnt out on that author because it's actually three different authors, you know? And I think there are good reasons like that. Frankly, there's a lot of people who have to do pen names to reinvent themselves after, mm -hmm. you know, a previous series didn't do well. I was talking to um, uh, Daniel Abraham, who's one half of James S.A. Corey, who did The Expanse. Yep. And I there's a remember. lot of him on my shelf right over there. Yeah, yes. yeah. I was talking to him at a con once um, and asking about like the pen name thing. And I mean, a there are two of them. So like it made sense to do a pen name. Right. But also he said something along the lines of every author name is kind of a lottery ticket. And he's like, you know, I am a failure as a horror writer, a middling successful fantasy writer and a wildly successful, you know, science fiction writer. Right. Um, all under different, you know, different names or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something to that because I think publishing is very interested in pegging you quickly. They love debuts because a debut could be anything. You're the present they're going to open and find out if you're a wild success or not. But if you're not, it's very quick for them to go, okay, this author only sells 5,000 copies. This author only sells 2,000 copies. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes the only way to get a publisher to really take a big chance on you is to do something under a brand new name so that they don't have that previous data uh, that they can use to kind of hamstring you. I don't know. We'll see. I, I hope Dark Hearts does really well and that the name James L. Sutter become, you know, is a useful name to attach to a project. But I totally, you know, have had that thought of what would I change my name to if I needed to rebrand? publishing it's messy it's definitely weird i one of the more clever things i've that i've seen pulled in the past is when i first read leviathan wakes 
and I was reading it in ebook and it was massive. I mean, it's a big book to begin with, but like the, yeah. you know, the file, I was getting to the end of the story and it still said I had 50% left and I was like, what is going on here? And for whatever reason, the version that I had had also tucked in the first dagger in the coin book from Daniel Abraham into oh, it. Oh, wow. And I, you know, I bought it, you know, just, you know, through yeah. Amazon or whatever. But, um, and I was on my way to San Diego Comic-Con and finishing the, finishing Leviathan Wakes on the plane. And then I just had this next book to start and I didn't know anything at all about it. And, and I started reading that. I actually like the dagger and the coin better than the expanse, but, oh, um, yeah. um, but I mean, I, I, I love both, but, um, but I think dagger and the coin has some of the most interesting, uh, fantasy world building that I've seen in a while. And it's just a very compelling, you know, political story over being, you know, you know hack and slash kind of, you know, fantasy stuff. But, um, but yeah, it is a, it's a weird landscape to be a part of. I mean, you talk about, you know, say like people like Shauna McGuire also writing as Mir Grant because she's doing two right, very different yeah. things in it an author like Rob Buffard, whose uh, first sci-fi series failed. And so when he came out with the, uh, the frost Files series, like I'm going to get it wrong, but it's like shit, all shit flying through the air. Um, it's, you know, because his main character is like telekinetic. Um, right. He rebranded as Jackson Ford so that he could completely separate himself into this, you know, yeah. this new arena. And it's been very successful for him. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of strategy involved that is outside of the act of writing. And I think that's a thing that you have to be aware of in this career. And that can be very difficult. I, we've been on for quite a while and I want to, before we, we finish up, I want to hit on writing craft stuff here. Yeah. Um, so some of the basic questions here is like one outliner pants or discovery somewhere in between what's the writing process look oh, like for you? Uh, outliner. Um, and that's because growing up in tie in work, you know, when you're working for a company, they want to know what you're going to make before you make it, you mm -hmm. know? So every novel that I did there had, you know, a really thorough outline and, as much as I hate the process of writing the outline, I love it once I have it because then I always know I have a roadmap. The novel writing process for me is, you know, three days of hell as I come up with that outline. And then I can write for six months with the security of knowing what I'm aiming toward. And that even if I feel stuck on this chapter, I know what happens in the next chapter. I think uh, I'm a fundamentally, you could call it lazy, you could call it efficient, but coming as out of you know, journalism and the sort of environment where working in a game publishing where somebody might say, I need a thousand words about dragons and I need it by 5 p.m., you know, <laughs> uh, that made me a very efficient writer. And so I love the efficiency of having a really thorough outline so I can just write the book once. Like the pantsers who write a book get to the end and go, okay, well, I'll just throw out those 50,000 words in the middle now that I know what actually needs to happen. God bless them. I'm glad they enjoy it, but that would kill me. <laughs> I did a panel uh, with Tony Adiemi, who did Children of Blood and Bone. Um, right. It was right before the book came out. So right before she became like the YA fantasy, you know, author du jour. And Tony's brilliant. But she told us that she did 24 drafts of oh Children of Blood and Bone before it was ready to be published. I don't have that kind of focus, right? I would no. never stick through something through 24 drafts. I, and I don't know, I don't remember what her specific writing style was, but that's the kind of thing that terrifies me. So I agree, like having a roadmap, I'm like naturally somewhere kind of in between with the things I'm on, you know, working on. Again, ADHD, it helps to have a guide rail, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, because the blank page is where you can stop and just stare and be like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going. But if there's at least a bullet point list, it goes a long way. Do you play with any kind of plotting systems? Is there- like, Absolutely. Any, yeah. Yeah, so I use, I'm a big fan of that structure, um, and I feel like I'm constantly adding on more and more and making it a more like sort of systematized process, but so what I do is I use a combination of the seven-point plot structure. The Dan Wells um, system? Yeah, exactly. I yeah. love, Dan's another friend of mine, uh, and it's funny, I didn't, I didn't discover that series, uh, that YouTube series by him until after I'd already written several novels um, and published several. But it just blew the top off my head. It was just like, oh, my God, this is so useful. Like, how have I not heard about this? Um, and then also for writing romance, I like Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes. And so I'll use a, a system where I create an Excel spreadsheet and I have a column for every character relationship in the book. So I'll do, you know, the main if it's a romance, I'll do the main romance. But then all of the interactions like between being the characters right so it'll be the main character will have sort of an arc an emotional arc from you know they start as x and by the end they've grown to become y uh but then you know maybe the character and their best friend character 
maybe the main character and their parent, you know, whatever it is. I like to have every significant relationship in the book growing and changing. You know, everybody's learning something, everybody's changing somehow. And so I'll often have half a dozen different arcs going on at the same time. And most of them will be seven point. Uh, I think the romancing the beat structure is something like 18 points. Uh, and so I like to really have that be finely graded in a romance. Um, but so what I'll do is I'll figure out all of those arcs. I'll break all those arcs down into individual beats, like what needs to happen. You know, this is the, the characters are sort of interested in each other. And then the next beat is they decide it will never work. You know, that kind of thing. And once I have all those beats, I will color code them, print them out, cut them up so that I have, you know, 50, 60 little slips of paper on the, on the floor. And I will try to arrange them into the smallest possible number of scenes, because I think that the more you can have, the more arcs you can have at play in a given scene, the more meaty the scene is, the more vitality, the more you know what every character is doing and thinking and feeling. I think even in an action adventure uh, novel or comic, I think it adds so much to the scene to know that like, yeah, they're shooting aliens, but also the main character is worried about their son and fighting with their ally who is also, you know, at the same time questioning their religion or whatever, you know, like having all of that at play adds so much flavor and lets you, let, makes dialogue a lot easier, makes everything feel richer. So I'll condense that into the fewest possible number of scenes, and then I'll try to come up with, okay, well, what is a scene that would allow me to have all these different plot beats at play at the same time? Like, what is a thing that allows me to have conflict with the parent character and an advancing of the love plot and this the other thing with the best friend character? Also, I feel like can be a really useful way to get the ball rolling on a scene so that it's not the blank page, because you know so much of what has to happen you just have to figure out the logic puzzle of like, okay, well, what is the scene that makes all this happen? Is it trying to go see a movie together? Like, what? How would you make all this work? That's basically my outline process, and it's uh, it definitely goes beautiful mind like all over the the office floor for a, a day or two, but then it's done. Everybody good needs a good murder board, right? Whatever exactly. the version of it is, that's one of the best parts of it to see it all laid out and be like, that looks like craziness, but if you can make it into something real, that's the real big deal. Tools of the trade, then. Uh, what software do you write in? What analog stuff? What do you do? Word. Oh, my God. It's just, it's just Word. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> I still feel like that's mostly what the traditional publishing industry runs on. It's certainly what all the role-playing companies I worked for worked on. Yeah, and, and I also know how to do some basic, you know, grep searches and stuff in there. So I have some degree of familiarity with it. And everybody says Scrivener's great. I believe them. It's not for me. And at the same time, I used to use, I wrote my first novel in Google Docs uh, when Google Docs were still pretty new. And every so often there would be flaky internet stuff and things would not work and I wouldn't be able to write my novel. And that spooked me enough that I just, it's Word, I back it up as many places as I can, you know, Dropbox, emailing it to myself, all those things. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of just Word and a lot of sticky notes. I'm always surprised that th there isn't more adoption of Scrivener in kind of the uh, RPG spaces because I feel like it's fairly uniquely suited, at least for like one person working on something like that because of the folder structures and everything that are built into it and being able to put reference material. And yeah, it's what I used to be, like I mentioned earlier, I have 140,000 words of a, yeah. of a homebrew RPG. It's the only way I can keep track of all of it. But at the same time, it does not collaborate well at all. You know, it's not right. I useful for two people or more to share. Well, and I think a lot of it comes down for me. It's always been like what plays well with Adobe, because when you're done mm -hmm. with this document, it's going to your layout person and you do not upset your layout person right. <laughs> and so your graphic designer. So if they say they want a word doc because that imports the styles properly, like you, you do the thing. I got to bet that um, the people that you work with in traditional publishing love that aspect about you coming from tabletop because the publishing landscape of working around, you know, photos and specific kind of layouts and all that kind of stuff means that, you know, don't screw with the, uh, <laughs> the, the design. You know, I hope so. I actually, I often tell people that one of the best things I think you can do as a writer is spend some time on the other side of the desk. You know, mm -hmm. if you can be an editor, if you can read slush, if you can work, uh, on graphic design, anything where you can get a sense of 
the problems that writers can cause for the rest of the company and then not do it. You know, that's why I love recommending slush reading, because if you read a hundred short story submissions, you will quickly notice things that irritate you. And by just avoiding those in your own writing, you've leveled up like instantly. And you've also, you get a sense of what people care about, what people are looking for, how to just be a professional, fun person to work with. I'm sure my publisher <laughs> sometimes resents that I have a lot of experience because it means that I have a lot of opinions also. <laughs> but I hope that I'm able to express them in a way that is helpful where I'm, you know, really, truly just trying to bring a little bit of extra experience to the table. You know, you mentioned, you know, reading all the additional stuff, and reading other people's work and whatever. And, and it reminds me that in looking at the promo materials for Dark Hearts, that uh, one of the recommendations for the book is from Cassandra Kaw. Yeah. And uh, I just interviewed Cassandra along with uh, Richard Kadri um, yeah, for their upcoming for Dead, book. Take the A Train. Right. Yes. And uh, which that the episode for people who are listening to this was actually probably going to come out after uh, this episode with you because that will be closer to the release of that book. But Cassandra is like one of the best writers working in that sort of cosmic horror, squicky, right. um, you know, body horror kind of zone. And I thought that was a hilarious recommendation to come from Cassandra, right, right. who's known for these just terrifying, you know, nothing but blackened teeth and stuff like that, you know, kind of kind of work. And then is recommending, you know, this this sweet queer rom com. So I, I don't know it, it, that really amused me, especially having you guys back to back as my interviews. No, that's that's great because it's it is funny, you know, when we were talking about like who could blurb this book and like because I come from science fiction fantasy. All the authors I know pretty much are science fiction and fantasy. And so it was kind of hard to find like, okay, which of my friends, you know, in the industry would be able to give a blurb that would mean something to somebody. And like Cass, you know, definitely writes a lot of horror, but also like plenty of it is queer. Like they've got a good following. And also just like we're buds. A while back, we taught like an eight part class on the Writing Excuses podcast all about writing for games. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And that that was so fun for the two of us to like co-teach together. But yeah, you know, you know, you make friends uh, with people all across the genres, and that's one of my favorite parts of this job is just getting to be friends with writers that I admire and that inspire me. You know, like I just started writing short uh, horror fiction in the last year or two after not having written short stories in a decade, and I told Cass like, it was partially just watching Cass and like everything you know they produce. Um, and just like how wildly creative and prolific and all of those things made me be like, oh, man, I want to do that. And so I ended up selling a couple of pieces to Nightmare and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction that were horror pieces. Um, and it was directly because of, you know, Cass and Joe Hill and Nathan Ballingrad and all these authors I was reading. So, yeah, uh, getting getting Cass to blurb my sweet uh, queer rom-com was definitely a, a fun little tidbit. I loved it. I, I, again, I, I thought it was fantastic. And I, I like what you talk about as far as, you know, if you get into the writing world, you'll find that, you know, your connections won't necessarily stay within genre. Uh, it's so and, small. Publishing yeah. is so small. I mean, again, not being an asshole, making yourself, you know, a, an asset in any of those uh, arenas, knowing how the, the business works uh, and ingratiating yourself in a, in a real genuine way. Not a yeah. climber way, you know, not a try hard way, but like actually just getting to know people. That's one of the things I always recommend to authors is like, don't go to a con and just chase the famous people around because it's not going to work. Like they already have their friends. They're already very busy. But the person who's, you know, at your level or maybe slightly above your level, like those are the people that you're actually going to be able to hang out with, make a connection with be useful to as a friend and beta reader, you know, you're going to be able to commiserate over the same sorts of problems. And that's going to create such a stronger bond. And then sooner or later, those people are going to get big, or you're going to get big and be, you'll all be able to help each other, right? Like you really want to invest in your cohort, not just in the famous people. And that's another reason to always, I mean, be nice to everybody, but especially, you know, be nice to that assistant editor, you know, be nice to that person who seems low in the hierarchy because publishing turns over real fast. And the person who was an aspiring author, you know, today is going to be the person who is a bestseller tomorrow. And I've seen that again and again with people I've worked. I mean, like we just talked about, like Gareth Hanrahan was a freelancer 
for me, you know, before mm -hmm. uh, he had a novel of his own, you know, and like the tables can turn really quickly. Like there's these days, like when I freelance for Paizo writing Pathfinder or Starfinder, I'm working for people who may not even have been at the company when I left, right? You know, so here's this game that I co-created, but now the people running it are folks, you know, 20 years younger than me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's just, that's how it works. And that's part of the fun, the churn, but be nice to everybody. Especially the publicists. Become friends with publicists. They're the best. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> they're, the, they're, they're so undersung but they're so important to this whole world and and uh some of my favorite people that i've met in publishing are our publicists in it, and they deserve all the accolades we can give them james this has been terrific as we wrap up here um i just want to know where people should be following you so like you know where on the web your website social media stuff you know we didn't record it before we got talking about the hellscape that is twitter <laughs> now because as we're talking we're a couple of days away from it becoming x who oh, knows yeah, in the future oh, yeah, what it'll there. be like it's there already yeah. Um, yeah, so you can find me. My website is jameslsutter.com. Um, you can find links to all my games, novels, music, whatever you want to know. It's there. You can also find me on Twitter for as long as that lasts at James L. Sutter, or I'm on Instagram at James underscore L underscore Sutter. And that's pretty much all the social media I'm doing. These You can find me on Facebook. I don't, I'm not very good about checking it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, please, you know, shoot me a tweet, you know, a comment on Instagram. Like I'm always happy to talk to people about writing and stuff. Well, like I said, I mean, I was, I was following your stuff for years on Twitter and I found a lot of the things that you were talking about there about writing really useful and helpful. Like I, I talked about earlier. So I think you're a great follow as far as that stuff goes. Uh, nice. Like I mentioned at the top, Dark Hearts is available now, um, yeah. not in the genre necessarily, but I think there's a lot of crossover in the people who listen to the show who are going to be interested in that kind of thing. Like I yeah. said, um, you know, I like you know, I was a band guy, so me yeah, you know, yeah. jumping into and reading it where I was like, oh, I didn't have quite the almost famous thing. I did work in rock radio for 13 years. Oh, so nice. Um, uh, so I, you know, I did was attached to those things. But um, yeah. Can I tell you one of my favorite things about the audiobook for Dark Hearts? Yes, um, absolutely. Part of, part of it was that I got to basically handpick the narrator because um, I had listened to Red, White and Royal Blue and loved that audiobook, And then they I was raving about it. And they were like, do you want us to just get? Ramon, who did that? And I was like, uh, yes, please. So that was amazing. <laughs> but the thing that really blew my mind is like, as a big audiobook fan, uh, I'd always wondered who writes the, the intro and outro music, you know, for every audiobook. You know, it's always got that jingle, that music bed. And so when we sold Dark Hearts, I asked Macmillan Audio, I was like, uh, can I apply to be that, that person? You know, can I send in some samples? And they were like, oh, yeah, sure, you can do it. So I got to write and record the intro and outro music for my own audiobook, which was so much fun. That's fantastic. I was going to say the only thing that ever disappoints me about sort of music oriented books is then not actually being able to listen to the music that's referenced in it. Right. You know, I mean, in Dark Hearts, that talk of this, you know, having this sort of like goth pop kind of thing where I was like, I'm into that. I would love that. <laughs> right, um, right. You know, if you take a novel like Grady Hendrix's We Sold Our Souls, where it's, you know, all this like sludgy, heavy metal stuff, I'm like, I want to listen to this. You know, yeah. it's the tough thing to go, oh, I can I, I can imagine what it would be in my head, but I just wish I had it for real. Yeah, right. That's like half the reason I want, like, I want movie rights to sell to this book so bad because I want to have that experience of like bringing in somebody that I love, like, you know, bleachers or sleep token or somebody who can come in and like write the music to be fair i did write all of the music that i put in the book like i know how it sounds i actually played an acoustic version of the song that the two boys write in the book at the book release party which was really oh that's fun. awesome yeah um but again i am not an international goth rock pop star so <laughs> you know i would love to hear it done properly but that's amazing that's really cool uh, well, James, thank you so much for all of this. I think there's a wealth of information here, hopefully, that the uh, the audience can grab onto and apply it to however they are doing their own writing journey. And uh, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I know this episode was a deviation from my usual interviews, but I hope you found a lot of useful insight into the intersection of genre fiction and RPG creation and the publishing world in general. Links to buy Dark Arts and several other James L. Sutter books are in the show notes. 
I use affiliate links, so purchasing with those supports my work on this program, but I always encourage you to shop your local indie bookstores whenever possible. Fictitious is available on all the major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Audible, and Amazon. If you're listening on an app or platform that allows you to like and subscribe, I would really appreciate you doing so. And leave me a comment about the episode. I love interacting with you and reading your feedback, and it also feeds the algorithm, which helps this show reach new listeners and helps my author guests find new readers. Every episode of Fictitious is available on my website, fictitiouspodcast.com, along with more info about the books and authors and all the relevant links to follow and support them. I recently launched a new site called Fictions and Fandoms, which is a reader-centric book news, reviews, and commentary site. The goal there is to provide thoughtful examination of genre fiction and to explore the fandoms and culture around it. The site is still in its infancy, but I hope you check it out and encourage its evolution at fictionsandfandoms.com. Fictitious is most social media active on Instagram and Blue Sky. The Instagram profile is Fictitious Pod. Blue Sky is a small but growing platform, but its writing and author community is vibrant and plentiful. You can find the show there as at fictitiouspodcast.com. If that handle sounds weird, it's because you can verify your account name on Blue Sky via your website. I've largely abandoned Twitter, but I still post basic updates there as Fictitious Pod. Next episode, author Caitlin Starling returns to the show to talk about her new sci-fi thriller, Last to Leave the Room. Subscribe to the show now so you don't miss it. Until then, I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. Fictitious.